All right, Pete. So I'm glad for you to come on the podcast. I did apologize. I missed our networking group earlier. Um, but so I, I love your book. I mean, I love the whole story behind it, but we're going to get into the back first because I want to hear about your background and growing up because you, you hey, Mitch, can I just say it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you very much for uh, for chatting with me. I appreciate cool. it. Not a lot of people say that. So I appreciate that. It's very nice. Well, where do you want to start? You want to start about your background? And because I know you've been through a lot, you've owned businesses, life changes, you've wor- lived around the world, one side of the world, now you're on the other side of the world, doing all kinds of stuff. Can we can we start that and hear about your history and your background? Let, yeah, okay. Let's start with the history, Mitch. I have stuffed it up. All right. Not many people are going to say that right from the start. But I'll tell you what, I've stuffed up my marriage. I've stuffed up my businesses. And that's the reason why I've actually written a book on it. In fact, um, the book is, as you've read it yourself, Family Matters, So Does Business. Just out, right? It's just available on Amazon. Absolutely right. Around the world. In fact, it's just got to number one uh, status as a bestseller in the UK here. So obviously, people think I've got something uh, important to say and and they're reading it. But what it is, Mitch, because so many people will tell you just how good they're doing and how well business is going. All right. That's not what happens in life. Right. You know, you've been, you're a lawyer. You're a successful lawyer. You know the crap that people go through. I've been through right. crap. You know, nobody wants to tell you the truth. Try. So this yeah. is a warts and all of the things that I have done badly, but how I've learned from them and how I've actually achieved to come back from the brink to have some really successful businesses. Okay, so let's go back to before you stuffed it up and how you got to stuffing it up. Oh, God, we're going way back, aren't we? Yeah. So the thing is that, you know, when we're young, Mitch, we have quite a bit of arrogance. That's for sure. But arrogance actually comes with ignorance. And I was ignorant thinking that, you know, I knew it all and I was going to do really well. Yeah, that's our biggest flaw, I think, as human beings. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that, Janelle and I, we've got six children, all right? Now, the thing is, I want to tell you what they're doing. I'm not trying to um, show off, even though I'm proud of them, but we've given them the same opportunities as what um, I'm doing with my uh, clients now. So, for example, Ben, my eldest, okay. is a doctor of ophthalmology, but an international rugby referee. So he went to wow. the Rugby World Cup last year cool. uh, in Japan. Michael, our next son, was an Olympian at the 2012 Olympics. Uh, Claire, uh, my what daughter, is an international dancer in um, in Irish and in Highland. Louisa yeah. also we had a scholarship like Michael did to a university in the United States there, and she had a rowing scholarship and is now an industrial engineer. Okay. Scott's a um, rowing um, is crew, right? The the yeah, long yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah crew, right? Yeah. Okay. So Michael was at Connecticut University um, Fairfield in Connecticut. Um, and Louisa saw how well he was doing. Thought, oh, I want a bit of that, Dad. So we nutted out a plan, and she went and did it. Okay. Scott is in the New Zealand Special Forces Army. We've got okay. no idea where in the world he is, which is he can't tell you. A good thing, right? And Callum, our youngest, is doing a PhD in virology at um, uh, Victoria well, that's University timely, huh? in, in Wellington. So as you can see, the kids have my height. But all the really good stuff comes from their mother. So they're really lucky. Right. They're a real bunch of underachievers. Yeah. So <laughs> what I'm saying there is, okay, I'm really proud of them. But, yeah. you know, they've made mistakes along the way. And when I talk to them, I say, all righty. Um, so there's been a mistake. Is it going to be a mistake or is it going to be a learning? Yeah. And if they learn from it, then they don't make the same mistake again. Well, isn't that really your mindset? Like people look at things as failure or they look at things like, well, I learned how not to do something. I mean, it's a growth opportunity, right? So it really depends on your, what's in your mind, how you look at it or your oh, children Mitch, look, look at it, right? Mitch, I love the way you're talking there because not too many people think like that, sir. I've interviewed because a lot Because it's of about your top two inches the, yeah. and it's your um, the subconscious putting the good stuff because so often, oh, here's an example for you. Those people that say, oh, I'm always late and they blink and well are, because they put into their subconscious, right. I'm going They've to be convinced late. themselves that they're always going to be late. You've yeah. got it. Right. And I'll tell you, we have the seven fundamental laws of business that we teach besides our, our leadership. But mindset is the very first one. Because when you sort your mindset out, then the rest of the business is going to flow. Right. Yeah. So if you put, if you're going to put crap in here, 
All right. Gonna crap Your subconscious out. is going to go to work to make it happen. Of course. Right. If you put the good stuff in there, it's amazing how well you will achieve. Yeah. I think a lot of it is anybody I've spoken to, I've spoken to habit scientists. I've spoken to all kinds of coaches, all kinds of marketing people. It all comes down to, like you said, your not self-consciousness, because when you're self-conscious, you, you have self-awareness. It's self-awareness. It's like you said, you know, stepping away from things and realizing that it's an opportunity to learn. Some people, you know, they don't, they don't fear failure. It's part of the process. You're going to fail, right? Aren't we all going to fail? We just don't know what it's going to be at. Yeah. Or yeah. how big the failure is going to be. Right. Or how big that. it's going to be to try to mitigate <laughs> that. But a lot of times if you don't fail and you're really successful, at some point you're going to hit a brick wall because you're not prepared for adversity. Some people and get that harder comes down to resilience then. Right. How are, you, are you resilient enough to climb out of the pothole that you've yeah. fallen into, dust yourself off, and then walk on, carry on down right. the journey? This whole pandemic thing, I mean, you've really seen people that are, you know, the resilient ones just rose right to the top. They, you know, we're going to grab this thing by the horns and we're going to go with it. Other people just went into hiding, freaking Literally, out. I love that. And I'll tell you what. I'm having a lot of courageous conversations with uh, people, with business owners. And by that, I mean, I'm actually calling out their crap because they say, oh, it's not going very well. And, I, and I'm suggesting to them, it's actually going really well. But you, sir, or you, ma'am, are choosing not to accept the opportunities that are out there. So yeah. actually get rid of the crap in your head and go and look for the opportunities. And don't give me this crap you're giving me. Yeah, I like that. And some people don't like that, Mitch. No. No, they don't. Well, because they're not ready. I don't know. They won't accept it. Maybe they're afraid. To, they want to, someone else to know. do it for them, sir. Yeah, there's a lot of people like that. It's unfortunate. Yeah. And Jillian talks about resilience all the time. Because she yeah. sees these people and the people that are surviving. Some yeah. people are thriving, like you said, in the pandemic. Yeah. Well, you know, I've chatted with you a couple of times. You, and, you know, you're an, obviously a really, really good operator. And you're seeing the opportunities. So you would have difficulty seeing people who have got a scarcity mentality because you're thinking, hang on, there's real opportunities out there that I can see. How come you're not seeing it? Right, right. Well, look, I changed the whole way that I run my practice because, you know, before, what does a local attorney do? Even in, in England, even in New Zealand, you hit the streets, you, you meet the local people, you know, everybody knows you in the community. Then you're locked in your house. So how are, how are you going to interact? So then I started connecting with people all over the world. That's how we met. But I changed, yeah. I shifted, what's the word? I shifted my paradigm as to how I looked at the world. Now the world's a lot bigger than I thought it was. And I think what you've also done is like, you know, the worst place we can be is in our comfort zone. And so many people want to stay there. We've right. actually got to widen the comfort zone, not get to the stress level, which is too high, right. but just to push that stress level slightly out of our comfort zone. Or you don't grow. Mean, yeah, we grow. Right. And then we can grow a little bit more. Yeah. And the comfort zone actually widens out. Whereas, you know, now, as you're seeing, because you've been doing that for so long, Mitch, for the last year or so, your comfort zone has widened right out. Whereas last year would have been your stress zone. Right. Now it's your comfort zone because you, you're you doing get used stuff. to it. You get more comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like your first time of doing anything. You should just accept it's going to be a bad experience. Like you come out of law school, you go to court the first time you're going to wet the bed right in front of the judge. I mean, you're going to, you know, because you're, you've never done it before. You don't know. You're nervous. You don't know what the judge is going to think of you, the other attorney. You don't remember the rules. You don't remember what to say. But if you kind of had a different mindset about it, like you said, it might go a little bit better. W won't be perfect. It's your first time in court still. Let me tell you a funny story. As you know, I used to be a policeman back in New Zealand. Right. And my very first court case, I had to give evidence on three cases in the same day. Testimony, and like in court? At, in court, in yeah. front of the judge and the okay. jury. All right. And I'll tell you, I was absolutely crapping myself. <laughs> you know, new policeman there, three yeah. cases, trying to remember everything. Got through the first one, all right. Went to the second one, and I started to give the same evidence that I'd done in the first case. Because you couldn't remember that it was different. Yeah. yeah. The judge stopped me, and he said, uh, excuse me, constable, I think we've already heard this evidence, and I think we've convicted this uh this person, are you trying to get another conviction and increase the sentence? <laughs> yeah, it was really At least good. he had a humor really about it, right? Judge. Yeah. And he said to me, look, just relax. I actually don't want you to try and remember verbatim, all right? But remember in your head what actually happened out there so we can actually 
get to the truth. And he was so good, Mitch, that I then relaxed after that and gave the evidence. And he, he commended me in the end. But uh, well, that's one of my stuff ups. Okay. So, and, and you were, you spent most of your career in New Zealand, right? Is that where you met Janelle and? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the th- the reason we're in England is that, as you may be aware, coming from New Zealand to even the United States is a 12 to 14 hour plane trip. Going to London is a you know 30 hour plane trip. Yeah. Now Janelle and I love traveling. So one day we thought, instead of doing this traveling from New Zealand all the time, let's go and base ourselves in England. Because if we put a pin in the map where we are, three hours gets us all through Europe, down into Africa as well. Whereas a pin in New Zealand, three hours, gets us just to the east coast of Australia and some of the islands above New Zealand. But apart from that, there's a huge amount of ocean to fall into. Yeah, you guys are really separate down there. Yeah. So So what were you doing at the time when you moved to London? Because not everybody, I'm reading that book, Marianne Cantwell, Be a Free Range Human. Like not everybody can just pick up and move to the other side. You basically moved to the other side of the world is what you did. So how were you able to do that? We were. And again, that just comes down to the what ifs. Janelle and I have never in our life wanted to look back and say, oh, what if we'd done this? Right. It's easier to try something and it doesn't work out than to not try something and then always wonder, oh, what if we tried it? Right, but we, you were no longer a police officer at that point? Oh, no, I'd moved, I'd moved away from that. I'd been uh, running my own businesses for uh, uh, a 15 years at that stage. Right, but they were um, the kind of business you could move? You could be yes. anywhere? Okay. Yeah, we, we had been coaching and mentoring businesses, uh, business owners. Okay. I'd also been running a financial um, uh, business enterprise plus insurance uh, in New Zealand as well. So okay. we were able to move. But I'll tell you much, here's the classic. All right. I thought moving to England, being another first world country, would have been quite easy. Yeah. Um, it was re- really, really difficult. Really? Oh, I, it is probably the hardest thing I've done in my life. Moving what what was so hard about it? Well, that's really interesting. Like the culture is different. Even though we speak English, yeah. but we're first world, just trying to integrate into the English way. And we had to integrate because it was their country. Right. All right. But the way they do things... Just the way, like you can tell, I'm quite gregarious, believe it or not. <laughs> the, the English are very conservative. So I've had to dial myself down. And I think that's why I get on so well with the Americans, because you guys are very similar to we Kiwis. You want to get out there. Yeah, exactly. And do stuff. Make it happen. Yeah, the English aren't quite. And it's no disrespect to the English, because let's face it, they've um, won a couple of world wars as an island. So they're doing pretty well, eh? Yeah, well, you know, it used to be the sun didn't set on the British Empire. That's not the truth anymore. So <laughs> yes, the monarchy is going to, you know, yeah. that might change in the next 50 or 100 years. So but. I was 53 when we upped country and left. And um, I think, you know, talking about resilience before, when you're in your 20s or 30s, it's yeah. a lot easier to move. It is. But I'll tell you what, at 53, I found it pretty difficult. Yeah, I'm 54. I think it would be difficult for me too. I mean, it's funny. We were talking recently. Not Mate, that you scrub up. You, you only wife. look 47. I, I appreciate that. But I, I was talking to my wife the other day. I forget what it was about. Somebody, one of us said, like, if we run the lottery, like, where would we go? We could go anywhere in the world. New Zealand came up. My wife's like, we should go to New Zealand. I'm like, why did you pick New Zealand? It just seems like a, a nice place to live. You know, it's not too crowded. A lot of land, beautiful countryside. I think the weather's kind of right. Your weather's pretty moderate. Mm. You know, she likes yeah, kiwis. It's, it's a good fruit, you know, so. Well, he, he, here's something for you. A little bit of knowledge. New Zealand is the same size as the British Isles, land-wise, yeah? Okay. Cool. So we have 4 million people in that land mass and yep. 15 million sheep. The UK... <laughs> The UK, they've got 66 million people yeah, in the right. same land mass. Yeah, well, that's why you're able to not have a COVID outbreak and stuff, because you can yeah. control and you probably still have a lot of beautiful countryside. And, you know, I, I don't know, I got a guy to visit New Zealand. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a very big, uh, I'm into fishing, it's fly fishing. And I know oh, there's a lot of beautiful fishing in New Zealand. Yeah. So you, that's when you come out and I'm back there, we'll go fly fishing. Definitely a bucket, bucket list yep. trip. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, by the way, I didn't even ask you, is this your first book? Yes, that's States. my very first one. It's on its second edition and okay. a, a UK bestseller. 
I'm in the process of writing the second book, which is a, a one on finance, because people in business don't know their numbers. So I'm trying to debunk the myths around up, numbers. Right. I know. You know why? Because I think most business owners, most entrepreneurs are really right brain people, right? They like to be creative. They want to do the marketing and the, this. I kind of feel that way too. They don't like dealing with their numbers. It just bores the heck out of them and they avoid it like the plague. And unfortunately, that's the really the only way to take a temperature of your business. You can't do it with, well, this marketing campaign is going great. Yeah, but you might have no cash flow. You don't even know if you're making money. So that's my thought about that. You're so right. And as we say to our clients, they're doing a marketing campaign. Hey, um, tell me, what's your return on investment? And they look at me blankly. So I say to them, okay, let me make it simple for you. If I give you 10, uh, if you give me 10 pound right. and I give you 12 pound back, how often are you going to do that marketing? And they right. go, oh, we'll do it all the time. Or uh, sorry, dollars. And you're well, so if the I, same thing, right? Yeah, if I give you $10, um, or sorry, you give me $10 and I only give you $8 back, how often are you going to do that marketing campaign? Right, never. They go, we're not going, not very long. Good, you've got to know your numbers to see whether it's working so you can either continue with that marketing campaign or change your strategy, Mitch. So how do you make, because this book, you, you, you did, a, there's a lot of analogies in here. You, you use um, um, airplanes and things, as an, you know, make it interesting. How do you make a book about finance interesting? Because some of them are very drab. Dry. Dry. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good question, Mitch. And the what I'm doing is I'm telling stories again in it. All right. Again, the mistakes that I've made. Right. How can you actually change that? So it's the analogies I've done with my clients. And what you've said just now about clients not wanting to know their numbers, and it comes down to laziness as well, because yeah. they don't want to know them just in case they don't look good. Right. Well, like that's crazy. Business, they don't want to know their business is losing money. They might have to change what they're doing. Yeah. So well, it's the same. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you've got a, 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 your lovely wife, all right, and she's spending all your money and you don't want to know about it, then I'm sorry, but you're in the wrong because you should actually be having meaningful dialogue with her to find out where that lovely dress has come from or those shoes, whatever it may be. Yeah. Okay. Have those courageous conversations about money because if you don't, um, you're going to go down the drain. Because as you said before as well, Mitch, you know, you can be a, have a profitable business, but go under. But if you've got great cash flow, then your business will be fine. Yeah, uh, that, it's, that's funny. That's a very good, uh, a good advice for marriage, right? Because I know a lot of guys who tell me, you know, oh my God, my wife spends so much money and I don't know what to do about it, whatever. And we're struggling with the business. And then when they go home and they finally talk to their wife, their wife says, well, why didn't you tell me we weren't making that kind of money? I wouldn't have bought all this stuff. Yeah. You know, because she was under the impression that everything was fine, you know, because that's what he led her to believe. He didn't want her to worry about it. You take care of the kids. You have your job, you know, whatever. And I, I think we do each other a disservice when we're not honest about it because you can deal with a lot of stuff together, but it's hard to deal with it when you've been dealing with it. Then you dump it on your partner. So listen, uh, we got to leave tomorrow because our house is being foreclosed. I've been in these situations where I'm delivering a notice or I have to go see someone and the tenant or the person is like, honey, we're being evicted today. She's like evicted, like had no clue as to what was going on in their life because he was hiding it from her. Didn't want to uh, upset her. Well, he upset her more. I think they got divorced actually. Mitch, I love, you're so right. And one of, one of the stories I have in the book there yeah. is that Janelle, Janelle and I have a three-day rule. Now, all the blokes who are listening to this will love this rule because it's for us. It's a good rule, yeah. All right, because the rule is because, you know, woman, I'll tell you, no disrespect, ladies, but you can remember stuff from a year ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. A year ago? How, how about 10 yeah, years how ago? I, how can I <laughs> argue against that? Because I can't yeah. even remember from three days ago. So Me neither. Janelle yeah. and I have a rule. Yeah. If you need to bring something up, some issue, you must bring it up within three days. That's a good rule. Otherwise, it's forever gotten. You can never bring it up again. It's all ashes after that. Yes. Yes. And I, I love that rule. Sometimes Janelle may say to me, Pete, you've annoyed me that much. Give me two hours before I can even think, talk to you. 
Okay. They know that I'm really in the doghouse. <laughs> but we get stuff sorted within three days. That's a very good rule. I mean, you you know, you my look, my wife's the same and our friends are the same. They you they could bring up things from five years ago and it's like it's happening to them right now. They're yep. so upset. And you don't even remember what color underwear you put on on Monday. And you're just well, trying you to make it up as you go. <laughs> what do you do? You can't even disagree. Yeah. You have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. You're like, all right, well, if, if I did, I apologize. You know, I usually apologize at the beginning. Whatever it is, sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't mean it, but you're right. I mean, that's not, look, when it comes to marriage, I think, and you and I are marriage counselors, but I think you got to fight fair. You know, you, you got to have a fair relationship. And a three day rule is, is fair because it recognizes that you shouldn't be walking around worried about things that might come up six months from now that you didn't realize. And, the, and it's also not healthy for her to walk around with stuff in her head for six months being upset about because it, it just festers. Look, what actually happens, Mitch, is that, in, as you say, in three to four months' time, you say something innocuous and your partner just explodes. Right, because it's and all been think, building. Yeah, where did that come from? I wasn't right. that bad what I said. But as you say, it's been building up over all this right. time. And that one little thing you said has just the dams burst. Right, because the little thing didn't look in it from an out objective standpoint as a big deal, but yeah. it added on to the pile that she's been. Yeah. Been it's like weights. All yeah. right. You put a little weight on here. It's not much. Put right. a bit more weight on or it gets a bit heavier, a little bit more weight, bit heavier, bit more weight. Bang. Right. Goes. Yeah. That's a good rule. So Janelle's your second wife, right? Yes, she is. I guess you didn't have a three day rule with your first wife. Uh, one of the learnings that I've uh, learned to should have had the three day rule. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, do you have children from your first marriage or they're all Janelle's kids? No, I have three from my first marriage, um, biological and th uh, Janelle has three from hers. Okay. But it's got to the stage we've been so long. Like I don't even think about it now. I've just got six children and I treat them all equally. Um, oh, so there, so you have three children and three stepchildren. It's like the Brady bunch. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, the pretty right. much the dad has three kids, the mom had three kids, they got married, they had six kids. Oh, okay. but they're all adults Thanks now. Much. You've raised them, you've been with them along, you know, their whole life. Yeah, yeah, they're great kids. They're so, when you moved to the UK, were they already adults? They were, they didn't come with yes. you. Yeah. yeah, they've all left home, so they're doing their own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so you, you guys like being in London? What is Janelle working? You guys work together in your company in London? Yes, we do. And I'll tell you what, the, the great thing about working together is that women just bring a totally different uh, perspective perspective to the business. Like women have this amazing intuition that, that we blokes, or I certainly don't have. And I'll tell you, when we work together, Janelle might just sort of slip in and um, you know talk about something or bring something up during our masterminds or our leadership programs, which is just so appropriate. I'm thinking... Where did that come from? I didn't think of that. And the perspective that we bring together is just huge when, we, when we're running our program. So I'm just in awe of what she does. And I'm just so blessed to have someone as, uh, as good as what Janelle is. That's great because it's very hard for some people to be in business with their spouse. Yeah, there is. It def yeah. You definitely well, need a three-day rule for that. Yeah, and I know my place, which is down here. So I look up all the time. <laughs> All right, so um, can we? Are there some stories in the book you want to talk about? Or I like the three-day rule. I didn't. I told yeah. you I didn't get past page sixty-five. So if there's stories in the book past page sixty-five, I'd like to hear about. Them. Here's another one for you. Being our eldest, he was um, about 18, 19 at the time, and uh, he had just got this new girlfriend which he wanted to impress, and uh, we were going away for the weekend and he said, dad, 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 can, can I borrow the car, please? I, you know, I want to really impress my date. And um, I said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that on the proviso that you mow the lawns first. Will that be a deal? Okay. Yeah. That, he was Go, supposed to mow the lawns easy. anyway? Yeah, that's, okay. that's fair enough. So we come home from the long weekend to a very, very upset and angry young man. And he said, Dad, you didn't leave the car keys for me. My weekend's been ruined because of you. And I said, well, that's interesting, Ben, because I'm sure I tied the car keys to the lawnmower handle. And he didn't even look. Exactly right. <laughs> well, that's training. You teach him next time he won't do that. Next time he'll mow the lawns. Because we had the deal. Mow the lawns, you can right. go and use the car. Nice. I like that learning. Oh, I'm going to use that one for sure. 
with my, cause I have kids. My, my, my oldest is 20. He's at, he's in the university at uh, in his third year. Lovely. And I have a What's daughter in high school. He's, you know, you know, you know what informatics is? Yes. Study of data, data systems. Yep. So he's wow. at Indiana University studying informatics. I never heard of it till he got there. He said, Dad, I'm moving out of the business school and I'm going to study informatics. I go, I want to talk to your advisor. What the hell is that? Some crappy thing you're going to go and, you know. So I talked to this guy. He says, no, it's the top one of the top five programs in the country. Yep. And it's an up and coming field. So I said, okay, good. That means I don't have to pay your bills forever. So whatever works, I'm good. Nice. So, and then I have two girls. Well, you've had a daughter? School, so. Yeah, two you daughters. You had a daughter as well? Two daughters. One is a senior in high school waiting on college and the little ones uh, freshmen so two yep. girls so a boy and two girls oh, i didn't lovely. do six i did three yeah here's another story for you and it speaks this relates to daughters right and um it's you know the thing is that we blokes are really protective of our daughters and you know both Jan, um claire and louisa have said to me oh you treat us so differently to what the boys are dad and i'm going yeah so <laughs> well it's not fair and I said, you're right, of course it's not fair. You're my daughter, all right? I don't, respectfully when I say this, but I don't want some bloke doing to you what I might have been doing to some other bloke's daughter yeah, when I was That's unfortunately younger. true, yeah. Yeah. Because you but were a teenager I, too, like all these other guys, you know. Yeah, I said to them, I said to them you know, if you get into a, a difficult situation which you feel uncomfortable about, what I want you to do is take out your phone and give it to the bloke and say, please ring my dad. And if it's all right with my dad, then it'll all be all right with me. <laughs> now, the thing is, two things have happened over this. I've never had a phone call from yeah, my sure daughter. You, right, I'm sure you have. So either nothing's happened or they've been that wild that everything's gone with the blokes <laughs> they've been with. Right, it's possible. But both of them have come to me in their latter years and said, Dad, you know, that was just so helpful because it took the pressure off us that if, we were in a difficult situation that didn't know how to handle it. We could just take our phone up and, and you know, you would be on the other end of the phone if we needed it. We could just say to the bloke, you know, you ring my dad. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate it to sound like a double standard, but it is, I am more protective of my yep. daughters than my six, three size, yep. 13 foot yep. son, you know, get over I, it, Mitch. Absolutely. It's double standards. And yeah. regardless of what our daughters say, we are men with daughters that want to protect and love them. And that's why that's a double standard. Yeah. And I'm sure you're, you're more than confident your daughters can handle themselves. And, oh. But, you know, you just know the other side of it. So, you know, yeah. the lack of trust. And but. I think it's actually a respect thing for our woman because, you know, the woman, they actually uh, nurture our children. They actually are the, the mothers of our children. They look after our homes and that. So we need to respect our woman. And it upsets me when I don't see this respect being shown to the woman. Yeah. Because it's so important, Mitch. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound chauvinistic, but if you look at everything in history, religion, things like, it's all about suppression of women. Yeah. You know, it's a real it's, man's it's, world. It's I mean, if we had world. women running all the countries in the world, there wouldn't be any war. <laughs> yeah. Women wouldn't go to war. They'd be like, yeah. why would we do that? We're just going to well, cry for a little while, feel better. We don't let our emotions out. We shoot each other. Here's the scary thing, you know, New Zealand, we've got a woman prime minister, we've got a woman leader of the opposition, and we've got a woman governor general. Country's going really well. Go figure. Yeah. See, there you go. Wasn't there a wasn't there a guy who was a, I don't know if he was the prime minister or whatever, and he said some stupid things. Maybe that's Australia. I thought it was New Zealand. I don't know. We, well, we have, this, we, that happens to most male. Uh, men in government, they say some stupid things. Yeah, some. I think I you guys, in fairness, have had one uh, bloke recently that's said some silly things. I mean, we're, yeah, you think so? I mean, <laughs> look, we're, we're intelligent, thinking men. We would never go into politics. Somebody said that to me, like, well, why don't good people run for office? Why would a good person run? Why would you do that to yourself and your family? <laughs> you know, yeah, there are some people that are good and ran for office, whatever, but yeah. half the time they regret it. Because they get embarrassed or, you know, stories come out about them that aren't even true or, yeah. I mean, it's just become so divisive in, in terms yeah. of the, in terms of the world, but it is what it is. I think a lot of the wars would have been subverted if they were avoided, if uh, there were women more at the helm Absolutely. than men. Absolutely. Again, it comes back to what I was saying before about that woman's intuition that we blokes don't have is that testosterone that uh, clouds our judgment. Whereas Definitely clouds your judgment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Woman so, had that ability. so you do a lot of coaching, you do a lot of uh, business mentoring. What, uh, what kind of advice do you have for people? So this is, you know, the, the accidental entrepreneur. I hope my audience is full of entrepreneurs, people getting started in business, moving in business. What kind of advice do you have for people and thoughts in terms of, you know, how do they move forward in their business? Things that you've told other, worked with other people. Sure. So quite simply, your first day at school, did you go into the classroom and know everything? No. No. Did you have a teacher up the front teaching you? Yeah. Of course you did. Of course. And that teacher or teachers were there for the next 10 to 12 years, teaching you and guiding you, right. giving you the advice, um, answering your questions. And then when you went to university or trade school, you had a professor at the front teaching and guiding you. At trade school, you had a, um, a person who had done it for years and years yeah. teaching you and guiding you. So why then, when you go into business, do you think you can do it yourself? Right. Yeah, it's a good point. All right. If you want to fast track your results, get a mentor. Now, I differentiate a mentor and a coach, and I believe that a coach will ask questions to elicit an answer. Okay. A mentor is someone who's actually been there and done it. Right. So Janelle and I, we've had 21 years of making mistakes or on the journey and running multiple businesses. Right. right? We know the mistakes you're probably going to make. So we can fast track your journey. So instead of um, 21 years of my mistakes, we can actually fast track you to sort your business out in three to four years. And okay. the thing is that it's not a silver bullet. It's not a quick fix solution. If you want a silver bullet, please go somewhere else. Because right. I'm not the right person for you. Right. Because Janelle and I, we will embed the seven fundamental laws to have a successful business so that it doesn't have to work with you there because most people, A, want more money, B, they want the freedom to spend with friends and family. And having been in the police, having attended so many deaths, yeah. not one person said to me, oh, can you go and get my spreadsheet? I just want to see what my business is making today. Right. And they actually go, oh, tell me, get my friends, get my family around. That's what's important to them. And the reason we go into business Mitch, is to have a vehicle that is going to give us the money and the freedom to have the type of life we want. But that will only happen if we actually get some guidance and mentorship, like we did when we went to school or university or, um, uh, or to trade school. Right. Well, I find that and I'm a big proponent of uh, business planning. It doesn't have to be a written business plan, but strategic something, because you're right. We go to school, you get, the, you know, you get back from the summer and you start school, you go to your class, what do they do? They give you a syllabus, they give you a track to run on. This is what the semester looks like. We're going to study US history and European history. And by the middle, this will happen and we'll get, but we don't do that in business. We don't lay out. So we go each day is like, we're just winging it. You know, that's where the whole concept of the accidental entrepreneur came from. People are starting businesses without mentors, without coaches, without a track to run on. And you can't know if you're off the track if you don't even know where the track is, right? So brilliant. I, I think it. that uh, what you're doing is great. So you do a lot of individual coaching and you have, you said, Matt, <coughs> excuse me, mastermind groups? We don't do individual coaching anymore, okay? Hmm. We, do, um, uh, we do group coaching. Okay. And the reason we do that is we can affect more people and give them more opportunities being in a group with other like-minded business owners so that everyone gets the energy and picks themselves up, asks the questions so that others can hear and say, gee, what's that's that question that I've been wondering about as well. And we give each other the answer. That's interesting so that, because not a lot of people do that, Pete. Correct. And also really importantly, we run our CL, CLS uh, programs, corporate leadership specialist programs, because I'm noticing in the world at present, and um, it may be a little bit different in the States, I'm not sure, but there's just a lack of leadership in our, um, with our country and our counties and our businesses and right. individually. And we've got to get that leadership component so we can have effective businesses, Mitch. Yeah. So you, so you, that leadership is more like larger corporations, people in, in C-suite positions, or there are all kinds of different people that take that course? Yes, pretty much. Um, we're in the C-suite. But the thing is that if we see someone who's got a growth mindset, then we will mentor them because they are the 
uh, absolute great client. We know we'll make a difference with them because they want to learn. They want to get their leadership uh, to that next stage, whatever their stage is, we'll guide them and take them there. Okay, so so looking back, like how do you think, you, you know, you came out of, um, well, you first you were a police officer, then you went into business. You didn't go to business school, right? You don't have an MBA or any of that type of stuff. You were self-taught, right? How did you, did you have mentors along the way? How did you get to where you are now where you're mentoring and teaching other businesses? How sure. did that develop? That, that's a great question, Mitch. And you're so right. Um, as well as being in the police, I was in the, New Ze in the New Zealand Army as well. So I've had the leadership training there in the police. I got to you know, fairly high levels in, in both those. I've been a, a high level referee. So there's that leadership, how understanding uh, how to deal with people. But the thing is that all the way through my policing, my army, my refereeing days in business, I've always had mentors, not one, but right. normally two or three, Multiple. depending on what I need. Right. And if I hadn't had mentors, I would not be where I am today. Right. Simple as that. Right. Now, these people that you met, uh, when how did you meet them throughout your life? You, they were from when you were young, people you grew up with? No, not entirely. And again, I put things out into the, into the universe. And the thing is that the universe hates a vacuum. So I'm pushing it out there and said, I need a mentor for, and it's amazing that in two or three days, someone comes into my life and they just like the, right the secret person. where they call that the law of attraction. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Great. You're onto it. Absolutely. <laughs> right. um, so I've sought out people. There's uh, people who I really respect and I've gone and say, Hey, look, um, I just really respect what you're doing in business and what you're doing as a person. Would you please help me and mentor me? Yeah. And no. in, um, uh, in response, please, can I give this to you, whatever it may be, what they may want. Right, so it's, right, right. it's about giving back as well. And yeah, quite I, often people have said to me, please don't give me anything, but pay it forward. Right. That's usually so what the, and I the good that. people want to do. Absolutely. Yes. I think when I, when I meet somebody who's young, they're coming out of uh, trade school, they're coming out of graduate school, whatever, they're getting started. I think good advice is, look, seek out people in your industry that are successful. And maybe you can't reach, you know, Richard Branson, but you might be able to you know, contact somebody at a little bit lower level and have coffee with one person a month. Ask them what made them successful. What kind of failures did they have? What have they learned? And one of them will become a mentor to you. Yeah. And I have mentors because of that reason. I would network with somebody. We kind of hit it off. So we would grab breakfast every couple of months and then stay in touch. And, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a process, but I think you learn a lot. You push the envelope, like you had said, people work with you. So instead of making mistakes for 25 years, like you did, Maybe they'll make it for three or four years and they'll, you know, push the success trajectory, I guess is the better word. But I think a lot of people, they miss that. They don't realize the resources they have with their network. They don't think they know anybody. They're like, I don't know how to network. Well, you probably know two or 300 people you're not even thinking about. Yeah, great call. Cool. And I think the really important thing is, Mitch, have a look at your circle of influence. And what I mean by this, I, I will ask all my clients, hey, tell me. And no, no fudging it now, but the five people that you're closest to, are they actually helping you to achieve what you want? Because if you're surrounded by five people who have got a negative outlook on life, guess who's going to be number six? Yeah, absolutely. And if you're surrounded by five people who aren't making the money that you want to make, guess who's going to be number six? Yeah. So start surrounding yourself with the people that are going to influence your life. And it may mean that you might have to get rid of one or two people. You in your might life. have to, but if they're dragging you down anyway, they're not helping you. They don't care Correct. about you. Yeah. You know, you don't really care about people when you're just trying to bring them down. I know yeah. I've, I've known people like that over the years. Maybe it's their own insecurities or whatever the reason is, yeah. but it doesn't serve you well. That's a tough that thing for people, I think. This is, I, I think what I'm finding in the UK here is that uh, quite often, People want to try and drag you down to their level. Yeah. Whereas I love the American. I love your culture. You you celebrate success so incredibly well. You think? I think and, I see a lot of people trying to drag you down too here. Oh, uh, you don't I see it as much. It. No. No, I haven't. I think I just I like the culture, the American culture, because you do. You want to celebrate the success. You look at your pioneering attitude. You know, you're one of the most successful countries in the world, and you only started a couple of hundred years or 400 years ago. That's true. And you look what you've done. You've gone from the East Coast across the West Coast 
You've piled driven in all those railway tracks. You've made these huge roads. You put men on the moon. All right. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Well, we're a melt melting pot. That's why we brought all these people from all over the world and got them all together. And yeah. So let's make stuff. Luckily, you had the Kiwis across there too, because that's what's made the difference for you. That's for sure. <laughs> that's what I was saying. There was a yeah. really good movie about New Zealand. It was um, kind of a rom-com movie, but it was um, this woman was an executive, very high, you know, very high stress job. And somehow she won a contest where she, she got an in in New Zealand. And she, so she's like, I'm going to go over there and take a look at it. And she, she needed to get away. Life was just beating her up. I think she had a heart attack, something like that. So I'm going to move to New Zealand. So she picks up, takes all of her stuff, sells all of her possessions, has a couple of bags of stuff, goes to this town in New Zealand. Off to, if I can find the movie, I'll send you a link for it. And gets to this location. And it is, well, there was a reason that they were giving this away, right? So it is just, you can't live in this building. I mean, there's sheep there. There's no plumbing. There's no electric. I don't think there were windows. It's just a a, a shell of a building. And the whole movie's about how she, you know, stays there and develops her life there and meets people, falls in love, whatever, and rebuilds this whole inn um, and opens it again to, to become an inn. But I got to, I'll have to think of the name. I'll figure it out. When I get home, my wife will be like, she'll know it. Yeah. She found the movie. Yeah, exactly. But that's nice. definitely New Zealand's on my bucket list. That and the bourbon trail in Kentucky. So. Okay. I like bourbon. Yeah. I'm a big bourbon guy. So. Nice. <laughs> no, you, you, we'll, we'll welcome you to New Zealand. You'll be fine. If you're going to go back. Um, we probably, well, here's the thing about it. Okay. Um, not too many people know this, but uh, in five years time, six years time, Janelle and I are heading back to New Zealand to build our new house. Okay. But we're not okay. flying home. We're going to swim. No, we're not going to swim either. We're going to drive overland in a four by four. It's going to take us 10 to 12 months to drive home. How can you do that? If isn't New Zealand an island? Yes, it is. Are so there what bridges it means, that connect? Yeah, well, not quite. We're going to have to take a boat, all right, between so you Malaysia. Can take a ferry, okay. Yeah, and uh, between Malaysia and Australia, and then Australia and New Zealand. But apart from that, there's about twenty or thirty countries that we can cruise through. Yeah. Um, until we get down to Malaysia, and it's just this is the thing that Janelle and I do. We think, hey, it's a little bit different, but it's something we want to do. What if? You know, we don't want to go back to New Zealand. Oh, what if we'd done that? It would have been so good. So it's always what we regret things we didn't yes. do. Was it Eat, Pray, Love? Was that the book where she just traveled the world? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but aren't there countries that you got to go through that are not the safest countries in the world? That's true, Mitch. But let me ask you: How many people died on the road in in the USA today with road accidents? I don't know. Well, yeah, there's more people in the United States, but yeah, the same with they hit an IED like, or something, you know? Yeah, the same with the UK. Lots of people have died on the roads today. Lots of people have died with cancer. If you have that, no disrespect when I say this, but if you have that attitude, you don't get anywhere. No, it's a good you point. You just got to get out and good do point. it. Good point. Just do it. Yeah. So, so you'd have to go through Eastern Europe. You have to go through some of, I guess, the Middle East, right? And then down, you work your way down to Malaysia? Yeah. Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Stan, Russia, Stan, all the Stans. Yeah. Tell Stan I said hi. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, so, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that sounds incredible. Yeah. An incredible Just, trip. Yeah, something to do. So, yeah. It's, yeah, something it to do. It's definitely something to do. You might <laughs> yeah. be living in your car some of the nights. I don't know. Oh, no, we've got to, we're going to build a big four by four van, which we will sleep in with, you know, all the. Oh, all the okay. Stuff. Almost like an RV, but a smaller vehicle. Correct. Like a but sprinter because, van. You're gonna. Yeah. Equip you know, it. in Pakistan, they and in India, they've got some huge passes there that you've got to get over. And the thing is that at our stage in life, instead of backpacking with you know hardly anything like we did in our twenties, right? We're actually going to have a lot, a lot more comfort, Mitch, because yeah. we can. I don't know if I would be so comfortable driving through Afghanistan as the sun's going down, knowing that I have to pull over and stay in my van, hoping that nobody comes up to the truck and says, open up the door, but he won't be saying it in English. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, I, I watched too many of those shows, you know, Homeland you know, and stuff. What's going to happen with us, it's the same in business. 
is you mitigate the risks as much as possible. Like we're not going to just be silly and, and drive where we want. Right. Like in business, let's mitigate the risks so we're going to make a profit. We're going to have cash flow. Mitigate the risks by taking the right roads, doing the um, uh, all the research beforehand to know where to go. Yeah, the main highways and not all yeah. the beaten path. And Absolutely. Stuff. That's exciting. It's an exciting trip. So if people want to interact with you, if they want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn about what you what you do for people, how do they do that? Really simple. There's a new app out and it's called Flow Page. Flow, flow Page? You didn't tell me about this. Page. Flow pa- Flow dot page. Yes. Okay. So flow dot page forward slash Pete O'Keefe. And okay. O'Keefe is spelt the Irish way. O K two E's, two F's. And another E. Okay. Right. That's the real yeah, it's right R. behind you too, so they can see it. Yeah. There you go. You got it. <laughs> okay. So what is Flow Page? So Flow Page. Like WhatsApp? Yeah. No, it's just it's it's an app. It is an app, but it has your Facebook, your LinkedIn, um, has your profile. Has oh, it's like Linktree. Have you seen Linktree? Same thing, yes. Okay, very good. So that okay, so we'll put that in the show notes and then people can go right there. Yeah. And they, they connect with you all over the world. And I think especially if you've got a question, Mitch, that you are scared to ask someone, please come and chat with Janelle and I, because there's no judgments, because I can guarantee the mistake or the learning you want to know, I've already made the mistake on it, so I can actually help you. So we don't judge because we know how important it is to be able to ask those questions that you're sometimes too scared to ask, because you think I might be silly. That's a nice Until one. you ask the question, yeah. you can't learn. That's a nice so offer. Please, okay. give us a ring. Love and also, you. by the way, I have four extra copies. I'm not giving up my copy, but I got four extra copies of your book. And if anybody's listening, if they want to drop me an email, they can Venmo me the money for the shipping and I'll ship them the book. Five bucks will cover it. I'll cover the difference. And, uh, and they can get a hold of your book. And if I could see you, you can give me an autograph, but you're on the other side of the world, so. Well, put it this way, Janelle and I are coming across to the US this year. Okay. Um, to, um, we've done part of Route 66 on our motorbike years oh, ago. Oh, nice. Harley Davidson. Yeah. We're going to come back to the States. So um, be careful with what you wish for, because we just might turn up on your doorstep. That would be great. And if you're going to get an autograph, then we're going to expect to have a beer or at least a coffee with you, sir. We got them all. Beer, coffee, bourbon, wine. Maybe push the boat some more. We want a beer as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Pete, I thank you for taking time on a Friday. Well, it's evening for you. It's late, right? Over there, it's 10 o'clock? No, 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 no. It's only uh, 20 past nine. Okay, so, so it's 420 here. So I wish you a very happy, nice weekend. And I'm sure we'll see each other at another event next week. Mitch, I want to thank you as well. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege to be on your podcast. And thank you for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Pete. Good seeing you. Take care. Bye.